uh, if you can and you want to stand, we understand. But if not, uh, we we also acknowledge that you can still receive a blessing from sitting down and doing the reading of God's Word. But anybody else got a word of praise or a word of testimony? You go ahead and be standing. Anybody else got a word of praise or a testimony this morning? And showed them the fruit of the land. And they told them and said, 
We came unto the land whither thou sent us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. Nevertheless, in verse 28, or you could put but right there, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there, and the Amicalites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites, and the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are able to overcome it. But the men that were up with, the, with him said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land which we have gone to search it, it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. And we saw the giants of the son of Anak, which came out of giants. And we were in our own sights as grasshoppers. And so we were in their sight. Now in verse 14, or chapter 14, verse 1. And all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried. And the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron. And the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt. Or would God that we had died in this wilderness. And wherefore, why hath the Lord brought us into this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and our children should be prey? Were it not better for us to return to Egypt? And they said one to another, Let us make a captain, and let us return into Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the uh, son of Jehunapha, which were of them that searched the land, rent their clothes, and they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it, it is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delight in us, then we will bring then he will bring us into this land and give it us, and a land which floweth with milk and honey. Only rebel not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of this land, for their bread is for us. Their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not, but all the congregation bade stone them with stone. And the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle. Now jump over to verse 21, and we're going to wrap it up here to read it. Now this is the Lord responding to what just went on. But as true, but truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. But all those men which have seen my glory and my miracles, which I did in Egypt and, I, and in the wilderness, and have tempted me now these ten times, and have not hearkened to my voice, or have not listened to me, surely they shall not see the land which I swear unto their fathers, neither shall any of them that provoke me see it. But my servant Caleb, because he hath another spirit with him, and hath followed me fully, him will I bring into the land wherein to he, he went, and his seed shall possess it. Now the Amicalites and the Canaanites dwell in the valley. Now don't you listen to this last verse right here. Now listen. Tomorrow you turn you and get you into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. You know what he told them? Go back the way you came from. Go back the way you came from. To wander or to go up. Let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you for your goodness, your grace, and your mercy. I thank you for all that you've done for me. And God, it is a week of thanksgiving. And I pray that, Lord, we'll be mindful to give you special praise this week and to exalt you and to declare to you how good you are. But also, Lord, I pray that we will be a people of thanksgiving. Lord, that it won't take a special occasion for us to declare the wonder and the goodness that is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I pray you take your word this morning and you add your spirit and your wisdom to it and that we'll be changed and we'll be challenged in this place today. And it's in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. To wander or to go up. Now, most of you know this passage and you've heard this passage taught and preached upon and I may have even preached on it. 
many times. But the, the story is this, is that those children of Israel, they had been slaves over in Egypt for a while. Moses, he was a, a fugitive. He had killed somebody, had been run off. God called him, the old fugitive, the murdering liar, called him back, and he was going to raise him up to deliver the people from Israel. He goes in there and he talks to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh says he will, but he won't. Says he will, but he won't. And so he begins to pour, perform these great miracles through Moses. You know the plagues, and he threw down the staff, and the staff became a snake, and all the different things, just great signs and great wonders. And one of the last one was the Passover lamb, where if you didn't apply the lamb, uh, uh, the blood of the of the lamb above the door. Then you lost your firstborn son. And based upon that, he was allowed to go. And then Pharaoh got mad and he started chasing after him. And they got over there to the uh, Red Sea and uh, didn't know what to do. And the Lord told Moses to stretch out his staff. And he stretched out his staff and the Red Sea parted. It says they crossed over on dry land. Not muddy land or nothing like that. It just said they crossed over on dry land. And then when Pharaoh and his great chariots got there into the middle of it, what happened? The two sides of the waves came crashing down and the enemy of the people of God was destroyed in that very moment. But then they were out there in the wilderness and they got hungry and what did God do? God provided manna. He provided water from a rock. They got tired of water there in chapter 11 and they wanted some meat. And what did God do? He provided quail. Every time that these people complained or every time they got into a place that they wanted something, God was always faithful to sustain them and to look out for them. But now, it had not been that long since they had come out of Egypt. They perceived the law. God has prepared them. He's ready to make, He's ready to take a group of ex-slaves that are wandering in the wilderness and He's ready to make them one of the strongest nations that will ever be. He's given them the law. He's laid it out to them. But yet they come up to this place in town. And they've got to make a choice to go up or to wander. To go up or to wander. And they decide, they go up there and they look around, and you heard what it said. They say, I saw everything was wonderful, everything was great, but they didn't think they could whip them. And so then they go back to God, and God tells them, okay, you go back the way you come from. Well, then they get to rethinking their decision, and they say, well, let's go back and fight. They got whooped. Because see, here at Kadesh Bernay was a specific time and a specific place that they had to decide whether they were going to go up or whether they were going to wander. I think about as we go into the Thanksgiving season. The Thanksgiving season. And I think about those pilgrims and those men and women, even before the pilgrims, that made the decision to get on the knee of the Penta and the Santa Maria. Not knowing exactly what lied on the other side. All they knew and all they felt was that God was telling them to go. They had remained in England. They couldn't worship God as they wanted to. They, they would try, they would fight, and it wouldn't produce anything. And so what did they do? They said, we're going to press on. We're going to go on. And it took courage for them to leave out. They lost many lives. But what do we have today? We have their heritage. That they love Christ so much that when it was decided whether they would wander or they would go up, they decided we will go up and we will go over whatever the obstacle is that's in front of us and we'll press on over. And that was a great sea and a great divide. And that's the question that we've got to ask today. It's a time for Thanksgiving and we should give thanks. And we can look back like the children of Israel could have looked back in this moment and seen many times that God's hand has delivered us and provided for us in many different but today, Romans chapel, and today, individual, as we go into a Thanksgiving season, will you choose to wander or to make your way up? I want you to notice now, the word wander is not used here. Now, the word to go up is used uh, two or three times, specifically there in verse 17 and uh Verse 17, it says, get you up and to go up. And then in verse 22, it says, and they ascended. And both of those are basically the same words. But I want to talk to you about what the word wander, W-A-N-D-E-R, now uh, uh, wander, that's how we say it here. And then the idea of going up. The word wander, what does the word wander mean? The word wander means to move around 
without a fixed course. Without aim or goal, just to go idly down any given path. Just to move and to do without having a purpose. I don't know about you, but we've got three or four different individuals around this area that love to drive a bike. And two or three of them I know don't have a job. They don't have to be nowhere. They don't have to go nowhere. And I pass them on the road. And I'm going to tell you this, they can make good time. But I see them, and you know what they're doing? They're just pedaling. they just driving what they're doing. They're wandering, passing time. No purpose, no point. they just pedaling around to see what ends up. You see, that's the idea of wandering. To have no point, no purpose, just to move to be moving. But then there's the idea of going up. The idea of going up. The word going up, another word for it is there in verse 22. And that word is to ascend. The word ascend or to go up means to climb. To move toward the top. To succeed. Or to rise up from a lower level. And we think about that and we talk about that. And many times we get that picture in the business world and in the business realm. But folks, I want you to listen to some of these scriptures right here. Listen to this. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 6. And He hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 15. But speaking the truth in love that they may grow up into Him in all things which is the head, even Christ. 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 2 As newborn babies desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 18 But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. To Him be glory and honor forever. Now each of these scriptures show the desire of our God to see Christians going up from a lower level to a higher level in maturity, to go up and to grow closer to Him. He is the goal. Do you know that? He is the goal. That we may lay hold of that. That's what Paul talks about over in Philippians. That He may apprehend that of which He was apprehended of. I want to tell you this. I didn't lay my hands on Jesus up there at Camp Jubilee. Jesus laid His hands on me. And then one day I'm going to be able to lay my hands on Him. And that is the goal of this story. That is the goal of I'll tell you this. As you think about the idea of wandering, and you think about the idea of going up, now you listen to this. Listen to this. The devil wants you to wander. He wants you to wander. He wants you to go around and around and around in circles. He wants you to have to fight the same battles. He wants you to have to deal with the same situations. He wants you to have to deal with the same circumstances. It might come in the form of a new person, a new situation, or a new task, but it's still, as long as He can get you doing the uh, ring around the road, see, He's got you. When God says, I'm tired of you running around in circles. I'm tired of you wondering. I want you to come up. I want you to rise up. I want you to succeed. I want you to get up from a lower level and come up to a higher level. He wants that for me as an individual. He wants that for you as an individual. And He wants it for His body to rise up and to go to the next level. And that's where they were at. That's where they were at. Now they didn't see this. And they didn't understand this. But they were at a place at a point in time to where they were going to choose to go around and around. Literally, when I looked it up this week, the Panoram Wilderness is about 75 miles north to south and about 90 miles east to west. And that's where they wandered for 40 years. For 40 years. And it all was based on a decision made at Kadesh Barnea. And they tried to go back and make another decision. But God said it wasn't. To wander or to move up. To wander or to move up. I want to point out some things real quickly here this morning. I got 17 points. No, I only got seven, but doesn't that sound a whole lot better than 17? See, there is all the perspective you look at. I think seven. 
E, F, or G, one of those in the alphabet. I quit using numbers because I think about them. I use letters now instead. Do you know that God wants you to go up? God wants you to succeed. He wants you to go from a lower level to a higher level. He's tired of you fighting the same battle. He's tired of having to save you from the same battle. He wants to give you the victory. Listen to this in verse 16. And I told you that the two names were going to mean something very special. But in these two names, we see God's will for the whole nation as they go over into Kadesh Barnea. These names are the name, these are the names of the men. These are the twelve spies right there between verses four and through about verse fifteen. That's the twelve spies. And these are the names of the men which Moses sent to spy out. And Moses called Hosea. Hosea, the son of Nun, and you can put a comma after Nun, and it would be Joshua. Hosea and Yahshua. Hosea and Yahshua. Now, I want you to know, many of us know this. Many of us know that the name Yahshua or Joshua means the Lord is salvation. Or that Yahweh saves. That He will deliver us from whatever the danger is that's coming against us. That He will fight for us. And not only will He fight, He has fought. And He has won the victory. But let me tell you something. Before they got to this point where they were going to have to make a decision whether they were going to wander or whether they were going to go up, listen to what His name was before He was sent out. His name was Hosea, which means a desire for salvation. Think about that. When he started out, all Joshua was was someone that represented a desire to be saved. A desire to be saved. But before God had Moses send him out and decide whether they should go up or whether they should wander, he said, no more will you have a desire to be saved, but the Lord will save you. The Lord will say, let me ask you this, folks, this morning. Don't you recognize the fact that God has brought you here? Don't you recognize the fact that God has blessed you and He has kept you and he has, His hand of protection has been upon you? And when you look around and you recognize where you're at, it's not the fact that you're desiring to be saved, but you are saved, you have been saved, and you will be saved. Why? Not because of what you've done, not because of who you are, not because of the money you have in the bank, but it's because Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. That's what matters at all. And in that name, I have victory. Not that I will have victory, but I stand in victory right now. He's already fought the battle, and he said it with his own words on the cross. It is finished. And that means the victory is mine. That means when it's time for me to go up to another level, I can go up to another level. I don't have to wander around, but i got to choose to go up to another level. Amen. got to choose to go up to another level. You see, I'm thankful that today I don't have a desire to be saved, but I am saved Amen. because the Lord is salvation. Yahshua. Listen to this. He doesn't change, folks. Before they went in this and they had to decide, He said, I want you to know that you've had the desire, but now I'm going to give you the fact that the Lord is salvation. This is what it says in Malachi chapter 6. Chapter 3, verse 6. For I am the Lord, I change not. Amen. Folks, that's what he said. He wanted them to go up. It was his desire. He would give them the victory. We're going to see that he gives it to Joshua as they march around that city and the walls fall. That's the way God can give victory. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8. It says, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Man, one of the songs that's been on my mind all this week is the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and they are saved. Folks, He is my victory. And God wants me to go up. He doesn't want me to wander around. He do not want me to fight the same battles. But He wants me to gain new ground. I want you to see something else. Not only does God want you to not wander, but go up. The shepherd cannot make you go up. The shepherd cannot make you go from a lower level to a higher level. 
Look there in verse 17. And Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan and said unto them, So get you up this way southward and go up into the mountain. Now notice he's saying go from this level to the next level. You need to go from this level to the next level. You need to rise up to a new place. And see the land, verse 18, what it is, and the people that dwell therein, whether they be strong or weak, few or many, and what the land is that they dwell in, whether it be good or bad, and what cities they be that they dwell in, whether in tents or in strongholds, and what is the land, and what the land is, whether it be fat or lean, whether it be wood therein or not, and be ye of good courage, and bring of the fruit of the land, now the time, now was the time of the first ripe grapes. I want you to notice something. This is Moses talking. What we know about Moses is that he may not have been a perfect man, but he was an obedient man. He stood there at the fiery bush and gave excuses about why he could not. And then at the end of it, he basically said, send with somebody else. I don't want to go. And he said, no, you're going to go. I'm going to give you everything that you need. And that was the only time we see God get frustrated with him is when he refuses to go. But from there on, we see the obedience of Moses, that he is willing to go. Now, his anger gets the better of him sometimes, so he is willing to go. The question here, we look at this and we think, is Moses willing to go? into Canaan land. Yes, he's willing to go into Canaan land. Yes, he's ready to go. But you know what? Even though he already knew what was over there and the blessing that was in store, all he could do was implant the idea if the people did not catch a vision for it, if the people weren't willing to go over, then Moses had to do no good in trying to leave them over there. And you know what he was pushing them to do? He says, you go check it out. You get up. You be willing. You head up in this thing. Be of good courage. He said, I want you to see if the people are strong or if they're weak. If the land is good or if it's bad. If the houses are tents or they're, and the livestock, if they're fat or the lean. And he says, be of good courage. Be of good courage. That's the same thing that he said over there. Folks, can I tell you this? That yes, it takes courage to move from where you're at right now. It takes courage. It takes courage to let go of things that's been your blankets for years that you've held on to. Maybe it's an addiction. Not a bad addiction. Maybe it's just TV watching instead of on Thursday night going out on visitation or whatever. But you don't know what it's going to be like to let go of that. I know how that feels. But he said, hey, you know what, guys? You've got to leave the familiarity of the group. You dwell. If you twill never leave, then the rest of them I know is never going to go. So if you go up there for 40 days and you check it out and see what it is. I looked up some quotes this week and one of them was by a man named Raymond Lundquist. I had no clue who Raymond Lundquist was until this morning. Raymond Lundquist was the pastor of the First Presbyterian Church of Hollywood from 1953 to 1971. And this is what he said. Courage is the power to let go of the familiar. Courage is the power to let go of the familiar. Folks, God, they had to be willing to give up the idea of Egypt. That's what we're going to see here in a minute. They're going to say, oh, if we could have went back to Egypt. Oh, if we could just have the good old days again. Oh, if we could just do this. Oh, if we could just stay here together in this group. But folks, that's not the way it happens with God. You've got to be willing to let go and to press on. To leave some things behind and see what God will do. The shepherd can't make you go up. You've got to choose to go up or whether you want to wander. And there's no doubt today whether God wants you to go up. He, like a father, wants to see a child mature, take his first steps, cut his stake up by his head. Praise God, time just got to the point he can cut his own stake now. He boogers it up really bad and leaves me a lot of chunks to eat afterwards. But praise God, he's cutting his own steak now. As long as I cut the fat off, then he'll deal with it. Let me ask you this. Will you move up? Will you press on? Yonah's chapel is a sleeping giant. Your Sunday school class is a sleeping giant. 
Your walk with the Lord can impress and impound upon those that are around you if you'll be willing to move up instead of just wander. I want you to think about the abundance that is in going up. There's an abundance there waiting upon you when you're willing to go up. Look there in verses 20 through 25. And they ascended. Now remember the word ascended means to go from one level to another level. They ascended by the south and came into Hebron where Ahiman, Sheshiah, and Talmiah, the children of Anak, were. Now Hebron was built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. And they came unto the brook of Eshcol. And the word Eshcol there literally means cluster. It was so, these grapes are so big that they named the valley cluster. That's how big they are. But look what happened. And cut down from thence a branch with one cluster of grapes, and they bear it between two upon one staff. Now you get the picture of how big those grapes are. Now I've seen some big grapes. Donnie Gunner takes pride in his grapes. And by golly, every time you go over there, he's going to take you on a tour of the Gunner Vineyard, and he's going to show you everything that he's got there, and you're going to have to sample those rascals too. And you better say they're good, even if they're not. Or you'll never get another tour. But then you think about it. Think about those bags you walk out of when you go into Walmart. You know those bags about all that rub jane, holes in them and all that. They said that these grapes were so big that me and Brother James would have to take a broom handle and slide the broom handle through them so that we could tote those grapes. Man, they had never seen grapes like this before. Never seen. And then it goes on to talk about the pomegranate. The pomegranates are a figure of blessing all through the Old Testament. So much so that there were over 400 of them engraved on the outside and on the, on the, uh, uh, the stuff that went into the temple because it was the blessing of God that was upon them, the pomegranates. And then it goes to talk about the figs. And listen to what it says over here. And the figs were, were a sign of blessing and of, and of harvest time and of benefit. Luke chapter 21 verse 30. And he, meaning Jesus, spake to them a parable. Behold, the fig tree and all the trees, when they now shoot forth, ye know of your own selves that summer is nigh and at hand. A time of blessing is coming when the figs begin to harvest. You look at that. They themselves, these ten, these twelve men said, I want you to know what we saw. Look at this. Look at how wonderful this is. Look at how great this is. It goes on to talk about it. The abundance of going up. Folks, that's what God, God in John 10, 10, it says, The thief cometh not but to kill, to steal, and to destroy. I am come that you might have life and that more abundantly. Folks, let me tell you this. We've experienced it some around here. In the revivals and in the camp meetings that we have, when we go up, we feel that presence of God. That God's wanting to tow us to another place, but something happens and we get right back into that place of familiarity. Right back into that groove. What happens? I don't know. Maybe it's what we see happens with the leaders of this ten or this twelve. You see, think about it. God wants us to go up. He don't want us to wander. The shepherd, he can't make you go up. And you know what? We've caught a glimpse of what awaits when we go up. The benefits, the abundance that's there. But look at this perspective the leaders have concerned have concerning going up. Look at verses 26 through 29. And they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and all the congregation of the children of Israel unto the wilderness of Panaram, Panaram and Kadesh and brought back words to them and unto the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him and said, We came unto the land whither thou sent us. And surely it floweth with milk and honey. And the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, the, we saw the children of Anak, the Amorites, and dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites, and the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites, they dwell by the sea coast of Jordan. Now notice, before we talk about the first report that they get, remember that these are the leaders of these people. If you look in verse chapter 13, verse 3, look what it says there. It says that Moses, by the commandment of the Lord, sent them from the wilderness of Panram, seal them up, remember, all 
those men were heads of the children of Israel. They were the leadership, the committees, the teachers, the deacons. And you know what? You're a leader around here whether you think you're not a leader or not. Somebody's listening to what you say. Somebody's listening to what you say and the attitude that we bear. People watch that. People look at that. And look at the first report. They say, man, look and see for yourself. Look at the size of these girls. Have you never seen such a thing like these girls? And look at the pomegranate taste of them. Oh, man, you see how sweet that is? And pomegranates ain't even sweet if you ever ate one of the bitterest things you ever eat in your life. And then a fig, I don't want a fig unless it's on a fig noon, praise God, but I'll tear a fig noon up. But you know what they're saying? They're saying, look at all this produce. Look at what we found here. And you can see it for yourself. We did like you said, Moses. We brought it back because it is the first ripe harvest. This is the best that it can give. And you know what, Moses? It is a place that flows with milk and honey. With milk and honey. Now, we've heard that a lot, but what does the saying mean? Flow it with milk and honey. Now let's put ourselves back in those times. The idea of milk, milk was a staple then as it is right now. Staple then, right now. They use it to drink. But uh, Papa Duck, yesterday, first thing he did when he got up is he filled him up a cup of milk like that and he chugged that milk back and Amy looked at him and said, I can't do that. He said, there's only one problem with it. It wasn't a little bit colder. He said, but other than that, that was perfect. And then they would take that milk and they would make curds, yeah. curds, and they would make cream, and they would make butter, and all that. But you know what? You know what you had to have if you were going to have milk? You had to have livestock. And see, livestock was a sign of wealth, a sign of blessing. So if you said it's a land that floweth with milk, you're saying it's enriched with cows. It's enriched with goats. It's enriched with sheep. And you know what you're saying then? It's got good land because the pasture land can uphold them. And they can be, it has milk flowing everywhere. It's an abundant state. And so what I see when they say it's a land that flows with milk, it's saying that it is a rich land. It is a rich land. It's, it, it, God, to, the value of that land is something else. But then he goes on to say that it's a land that flows with milk and what? Milk and honey. Now, honey... It was, it was a sign of richness too, a sign of prosperity, but it was a sweet delight. It was a delicacy. Not everybody could afford honey. Not everybody could get their hands on honey. But they said, hey, it's flowing with milk and honey. You know what that meant? It meant they had a lot of flowers growing around there because what makes honey? Bees. Do you know that a teaspoon of honey is the life's work of a bee? Every time you take a spoonful, you, you just ate the work of one bee of his whole life. But now think about it. They're saying, and what does that mean? That means that there's good for crops and we can grow a lot of crops. What they're saying is saying, this land has blessed us and we can be, we will be wealthy and we will be delicate there. It will sustain us. And notice what he says. He's not saying it just has milk and honey. He says it is flowing with milk and honey. It is the place that we've been looking for. It's the place where we can be blessed, sustained, and upheld, and God's favor will be on us. But the second report makes the first report null and void. Nevertheless, the people be strong and dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak. And the Amalekites dwell there. Blah, blah, blah. The children of Anak, those are the children of Zion. Giants. They're the descendants of giants. And the Amalekites, the Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites, and the Canaanites. What they're saying, there's a lot of people that's going to come up against us if we go in there too. We're going to fight against us. You know what? That's the spirit we get. Now look at it. Right now. Right now. What have they said? Man, there is so much that we cannot even tell you the blessings that reside there if we're willing to go up. But there's going to be a fight if we go up. There's going to be a battle for us to gain this promised land. There's going to be a battle for us to go up to that place. And in 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 7 it says that God has not given us a spirit of fear but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Do they not remember the Red Sea? Do they not remember the manna? Do they not remember? No, you know what we tell you why? Because their perspective is on them right then and right there. They were comfortable where they were at. They were not willing to play a press on. 
But there was one voice that was willing to cry out. Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are able to overcome. He was just echoing what Paul would say over in the New Testament, Romans chapter 8, verse 37. Nay, in all things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. He said we can have the victory. It doesn't matter what we saw with our eyes. It doesn't matter what we see. It, it matters who we trust. And that, didn't y'all remember that Joshua is no longer Hosea, but the one that, that, who desires salvation, but he is Joshua, and the Lord that saves? He says we don't have to wander. We can go up, we can gain new levels, we can go to new places. But then the naysayers speak up again. The naysayers speak up again. The leaders. But the men that went up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. And we saw the giants, the son of Anak, which, uh, which came of the giants, and we were in their sights, in our sights as grasshoppers, and in their sights. Now notice what they're doing is they're really just echoing what they're already saying. These are big bad men. Big bad, but they thug one else in there, and I think they just add this wrong because think about it. They already talked about how good the land was for farming, didn't they? They already showed everything they had. But what did they say? They, oh, did we forget to tell you that this land literally eats the people up that are around it? You see, the longer you linger, the more excuses you can have. The longer you stay wandering, the longer you don't choose to go up, the more familiar and the more willing you're going to be to stay right there because it's always going to get better and better at where you're at. It always will. But you know what they forgot? No matter if they were the sons of Anak, if they were the sons of the devil, they still weren't stronger than their God. They still weren't bigger than their God. And that's the same is true here today. God wants you to be a, 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 a mature and growing up in the Lord. And the battles, yes, you're going to fight and it's going to be difficult to gain new ground. But praise God, we don't have to wonder we can go up. But the question is, is what we see when we go up worth the battle we're going to fight? And then there's one last call from the men of God. 10 to 12. 10 to 12. Ten are saying we can't take it. Two are saying we can take it. Right here in verse chapter 14. And Joshua the son of Nun, and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, Je Je which were of them that searched the land, rent their clothes, and spake unto all the country of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it is an exceedingly good land. And notice, they said it devours everybody. But what did these men say? It is a good land. The Lord delight in us. If the Lord delight in us, then He will bring us into this land and give it to us, and the land which floweth will milk and honey. Only rebel ye not against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bread for us. Remember a while ago they said, we're as grasshoppers in front of them. And He says, man, they are bread. We don't eat them up in the name of Jesus. We are about if God gives us the victory. Their defenses is departed from them. They have nothing to protect them from our God. And the Lord is with us. Fear them not. Listen to that. He's in front. He said, listen guys. We can have this victory. We can go over. We can gain the places that God promised our forefathers. We can lay our hands on that which is just over the mountain. John 16, 33 these things have I spoken unto you, that in me ye may have peace. In the world ye, have, ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Romans chapter 8, verse 31. What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 57. Be thankful to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And in 1 John 4, 4. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is He that is in you than he that is in the world. Yeah. But you know what? Ten to two, 
All of these were leaders of their own groups. Remember that? They were heads of certain areas. You know that man's natural disposition is not to have to struggle. Not to have to struggle. And all it takes is for somebody to look at me and say, it's all right. And I'll say, you're right. It is okay. And what you see happen, I'm not going to read it, but what you see happen is that they begin to say, oh, listen at the ten. Oh, the ten. They're, they're saying this. Do you know what? Why, Lord, did you bring us here to die? Why can't we just die right here? But now we're going to be the prey of all these hepatitis and hepatitis and, and parasites and all this. And you know what? God wanted to kill them right then. He didn't even want to let them wander. Didn't even want to let them wander. But good leader fell down on his knees and began to pray for them. And God says, okay. Okay, you do this and all that. You ain't got to go up. But none of you's going to see the promised land. You're all going to be doomed to wander for 40 years. Except Caleb and Joshua. But then I want to read you the last passage right there. Verse 25 of chapter 14. And we're going to close it out. Tomorrow, turn you and get you back into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. You know what? Something about that way. They had already been on that way. They had already seen the sights that were on that way. And you know what God said? Go back the way you come from. You like that road? Stay on that road. How many times, you reckon, while they were out there in the wilderness, did they pass the same old rock? And look at the same old thing? And see the same old thing? For 40 years. And every time they pass that rock, now maybe not at the beginning, because you know they were probably young, but once they begin to get old and gray, and their mind would go back to the day, why? Why didn't we just push on? Why didn't we? Why didn't we remember the manna? Why didn't we remember the quail? Why didn't we remember the Red Sea? Why didn't we remember the, remember the Passover? But they did not. They did not seek to go up in maturity. They did not seek to go up in their relationship with Christ. They did not seek to be closer to Him. And because of that, they stayed there in the wilderness. And their children carry them all over. Let me ask you this. What if our forefathers would have chosen to stay in England? What if they said, we'll just deal with it? What if we'll just stay over here? We won't choose to press on. Where would the world be right now? You know what? Many of us may not be saved. Many of us may not know the Lord Jesus Christ, but there's one other definition to going up that I haven't told you. And it's a religious one. Because many times what you read is that certain time of the year, people would go up into the temple. And they would offer up the sacrifice. You see, the thing is, is that when we choose to wander, not only do we choose not to go up, but we choose not to sacrifice and worship God. Because when we choose to go up, we are offering up our lives as a living sacrament unto Him. Oh, praise God. It's Thanksgiving. We should celebrate the fact that God has delivered us, that we're not just desiring salvation today, but that we have salvation. And if you don't have salvation... The day can be the day that you could be saved as our piano player and our song uh, director comes forth. I'd love to show you. Look, and you'll give thanks for this gift throughout eternity. But others in here today, the devil's got you on that carousel and you just wander and you're going around and around and you're moving and you're going, but there's no really point. There's no real purpose there. Today you need to make that choice that you're going to go up, that you're going to move from a low level to a higher level. Others today, maybe you need to join. I don't know what it is you might need to do. But today is your day because God says, I'm going to meet with you. And He's dealing with hearts and minds right now. So as we go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, in Jesus' name, I come to you right now. And God, I thank you for this day. And Lord, I'm thankful, Lord, that you love me enough that today, like you wrote over in the book of 1 uh, John, 
These things have I written that ye may know that ye have eternal life. Lord, I don't just desire to have a relationship with you, but I have a relationship with you. And today, Heavenly Father, Lord, I don't know what you're trying to do. I don't know what the will is today, but you do, Lord. As we're thinking about wandering versus going up, going around without any point, or moving from a lower place to a higher place in our relationship with you. So God, right now, as we stand, you have your will in your way. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Let's stand as we stand. The altar is open this morning.